Hello everyone and welcome back to Fly From Home. It's your uh, friendly neighbourhood flying instructor Kitty back here with you again for another FS 2020 add-on review. And uh, today ladies and gents it is, uh, as you may have guessed, turbo time. It's... <laughs> It's uh, it's time to review this aeroplane here. It is the Just Flight Piper Turbo Arrow, and we're going to put her through her paces, uh, just as we did with the uh, Arrow 3. Now, anyone who's watched that video will know that I um, I'm a big fan of that aircraft. Um, it did perform very well in the tests that I put it through. So I'm going to be holding this aeroplane to the same high standards as uh, I did that one. Um, anyone not familiar with uh, the structure of these reviews that we do on this channel, uh, I'll just describe what we do. Uh, there are going to be lots of timestamps in the descriptions because these are quite long videos and I uh, presume that not everyone is going to be interested in all of the stuff that I'm presenting here. So I'll provide you with plenty of timestamps to skip ahead. But with what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about the history of the real aeroplane uh, and the shortfalls and pitfalls of uh, this aeroplane and its slightly newer sibling, which is also included in this package. Um, we're also going to have a look at the external and internal models, some of the uh, paint schemes that come with the aircraft. Then we're going to get into the simulator. We're going to set her up using real-world checklists. Uh, we're going to take off, fly a basic uh, little cross-country flight from Doncaster in the UK to Nottingham with a bit of general handling thrown in, uh, a little bit of systems work just to um, showcase what this aircraft can do and how that um, matches up to what the real aeroplane does. We'll then get into the circuit at Nottingham and we'll fly three circuits, a standard full flap approach, a flapless uh, approach for a touch and go, all three, to, um, two, two, two touch and goes, sorry, and a full stop landing to, to end it with. And the full stop landing will be off a glide approach and uh, I will be giving my final um, conclusions at the end of the video as to whether I think this aeroplane is uh, is worth the price. Uh, just a quick note on that one. Anyone who has the regular arrow already will get a 66% discount off Just Flight's website um, on these two aeroplanes. So it's pretty good value if you do want to add these to the stable. Uh, and you might think, oh, well, yeah, okay, it's just a couple of new skins uh, for the Arrow 3. Well, it really isn't, um, and we'll go into that as the video goes on. So we're going to get started, first of all, uh, by talking a little bit about the history of the real aircraft. Okay, so Piper decided to um, upgrade the Arrow, as it were, in uh, 1977. So that's for the last sort of... Um, couple years, I believe, of the Arrow 3's run. Um, so they decided to whack a uh, Continental turbocharged uh, TSIO 360F um, onto the Arrow 3 airframe. No real changes um, structurally from the uh, engine back. It's all the same aircraft uh, and much of the same systems. Uh, however, there were some significantly different uh, systems associated with a turbocharged engine. Now, um, the initial um, goal with this aeroplane really was to add a relatively uh, simple, uh, relatively lightweight turbocharged engine to what was then the world's most popular retractable single engine aeroplane and basically upgrade it to deliver high altitude, high speed performance on a par with things like the Mooney, for example. And uh, given that this was only um, about four and a half thousand dollars more expensive than a regular Arrow, it was uh, pretty good value at the time. Now, uh, it all sounds uh, absolutely fantastic, doesn't it? You get a, a, an Arrow that can cruise up to about 170 knots, 177 knots, I believe, actually, uh, at high altitude, up from the 150 or so of the regular Arrow. Uh, it can also perform to much higher altitudes, it's cleared for flight up to 20,000 feet. Obviously, you'll need oxygen for that. Um, whereas the regular arrow is uh, limited to about 15,000 as its maximum altitude. So it can go higher, it can go faster. Everything's sounding really good, isn't it? However, um, there are some 
problems with whacking this turbocharger uh, on the aircraft. Now, in order to keep the weight down and the uh, complexity down and the price down, um, what Piper did is they added uh, a turbocharger with what's called a fixed waste gate. Now, I'm not going to go massively into um, aircraft turbocharger science in this video. I may do if there's enough demand for it. Um, but suffice to say, what a turbocharger does for an aircraft is it starts off on the ground delivering very little what's called boost, which is added pressure into the intake manifold of the aircraft. And as the aircraft climbs and the ambient pressure becomes less and less, um, the turbocharger will deliver more and more boost to maintain what's called sea level rated horsepower. So that's basically the amount of horsepower that the engine develops with sea level standard pressure. And the, tur uh, the turbocharger in the arrow can keep delivering sea level rated horsepower up to what's called its critical altitude, which is 12,000 feet. Now, on a regular turbocharged aircraft, or a, a slightly more high-tech, shall we say, turbocharged aircraft, for example, uh, the Seneca, you have what's called a waste gate. Now, the, what the waste gate does is it starts off in, a, in an open position at sea level when you've got plenty of uh, nice dense air knocking about. And as the aircraft climbs, the waste gate will progressively close to increase the amount of um, effort, basically, the amount of compressed air that the turbocharger is throwing into the air intake to maintain essentially sea level pressure uh, regardless of how high you climb up to a point obviously you'll get to a point where the wastegate is fully closed the turbocharger cannot deliver any more um, power uh, or any more compress uh, compression into the engine and you'll run out of run out of puff basically for want of a better word um, and that's what's called the critical altitude so that's great if you have uh, a moving uh, wastegate but the wastegate, obviously, it takes weight itself. The mechanism uh, it has a certain amount of weight to it. It also requires all sorts of air pressure sensors and things like that. Um, so it adds weight and complexity. What Piper did with fitting a fixed wastegate was get rid of all that, that weight and complexity. However, a fixed wastegate means that you are able to deliver all of that extra air pressure at whatever altitude you're at. So even if you're sat on the ground, you can force the turbocharger to spin up to maximum power and ram a bunch of air into the engine. Uh, now, that sounds kind of cool, I guess. Um, <laughs> probably uh, sounds like you can all of a sudden make the aeroplane shoot forward uh, like VTEC kicked in or something. Um, but unfortunately, that's not the case. Air aero engines are relatively delicate things. They're, they're quite sort of sturdy in, in most senses, but you don't want to be ramming a bunch of compressed air into the engine. Compressed air, of course, there's an associated rise in temperature with compressing air, which means that it's hot. So you're overheating your engine, um, you're increasing the amount of pressure inside the cylinders, and you can cause all sorts of damage to valves, and you can obviously cause overheating. Now, the aircraft does have an emergency um, boost outflow, overboost valve, as it were. So if you exceed the maximum boost pressure of, I believe, 42 inches of manifold pressure, um, 42 inches of mercury that is then the the, uh, the boost valve will open it will dump some of that excess boost overboard however that's not going to stop the engine uh, overheating and it can still cause damage and excess wear and that is modeled in this aircraft so you can burn uh, this airplane's engine out and cause an engine failure by mishandling it at low altitude now obviously where this is most critical is on takeoff because you're going to want uh, to put the throttle forward and deliver maximum power. However, you can't do that because if you do that, you're going to overboost the engine. So this is kind of a strange situation whereby, you know, you, you sit on the runway and you're always used to throwing the throttle forward and going to maximum throttle opening for, for takeoff. In this aircraft, you have to very carefully advance the throttle up to um, the maximum power setting of 41 inches and holding it there um, and obviously as the aircraft accelerates and settles in the boost will rise a little bit so you basically hold the aircraft on the brakes go up to about sort of 35 inches release the brakes and then have to, to push the throttle forward now that's all well and good however generally on, t on a takeoff roll you're concentrating on lots of other things including keeping the airplane straight and 
pulling the yoke back at the uh, VR, at the rotation speed, and looking out for obstacles and monitoring all your other temperatures and pressures to make sure there's no other technical faults with the engine which would cause you to reject the takeoff. And looking for birds and, and who el who knows other things. So you don't really want to be staring down at the manifold air pressure gauge. Um, add to that another l lovely little feature that Piper introduced um, with the other arrow in this package. You have quite a complicated finicky aeroplane to fly and bear in mind the arrow originally is an aeroplane for um, relatively low hours pilots who maybe don't have much experience or any experience in retractable gear complex aeroplanes and all of a sudden they've suddenly got this finicky difficult tricky aeroplane to take off uh, and, and an engine which is difficult to manage now bear in mind that this uh, aircraft also has a revised cowling so you can see it's got a different shaped cowling to the Arrow 3. This is the Turbo Arrow 3 here so you can see this kind of scoop at the bottom with the landing light in it and this quite uh, sleek shaping here with very little cooling fins and things in it. Now if I go and have a look at the Arrow 3 you can see that the cowling is deeper, it's bigger and there are a lot more air scoops and openings here and gills here so there's a lot more, this is actually a hole, it's, they've not actually modelled this all that well, um, but this is a hole in real life for the uh, oil cooler. So there's a lot more cooling uh, in this um, cowling here than the Turbo Arrow. Now the reason for that is the Turbo Arrow uh, is obviously presumed to be flying at high altitude a lot of its time. Uh, and at high altitude temperatures are obviously a lot lower and you have the opposite problem uh, to the problems you have on the ground, whereby you can possibly overcool the engine. And that's equally damaging because if the oil gets too cool, it's uh, not going to be lubricating the cylinders and the pistons and the valves and all the rest of it properly. Uh, and it's going to cause damage to the engine. So they closed up the cowling and made this nice sleek aerodynamic fairing here um, to keep the engine warm at altitude. However, it obviously has the opposite effect at low altitude and it means the engine is prone to overheating. Adding that to the overboost issue and the overheating that you can get with that. Uh, and you basically have, um, as I said, a difficult aeroplane to manage. So it's not really one for the beginners. Um, and as somebody who has uh, done a course with somebody um, to convert them from a regular arrow to one of these turbos, it was uh, quite tricky. As soon as the workload starts going up on the takeoff roll when you're doing a touch and go, something like that, the tendency is, um, as with most pilots, you grab the throttle, you throw it all the way to the stops on the on the takeoff roll. You just forget about that that boost issue, and and obviously there's also the tendency to over con uh, concentrate on the boost issue. So you're staring at the manifold air pressure gauge. You're not looking where you're going. You're wandering off the center line. Uh, you're not looking at your airspeed for your rotation and all sorts of other things. So. Um, yeah, tricky aeroplane to fly. Um, not my, uh, not my favourite. It's a fun aeroplane in certain ways. It's a challenging aeroplane, uh, but it's certainly um, not one I would recommend to absolute beginners who are getting into complex aircraft in real life. Anyway, in Microsoft Flight Simulator, uh, it might be just the challenge you're looking for. Now, I did mention that uh, there are two arrows included in this package. Very generous of Just Flight to do that. Uh, and the first one is a very uh, familiar looking Arrow 3 and the other one is an aeroplane uh, which I mentioned briefly in the previous Arrow video. In fact I said something along the lines of there were a couple of other variants which came after that but we don't talk about those. Get thee behind me Satan Arrow 4. Um, <laughs> And I feel I probably need to justify that statement now. So let's uh, let's have a quick look at it, shall we? Now the Arrow 4 was um, brought out in the late 70s, very late 70s, 79, I believe. Um, and essentially, it's it's just the Arrow 3 uh, with this important addition on the back end. They changed the. Um, old stabilator which sat uh, on the bottom of the fuselage into a T-tail. It's still um, all moving, 
it still has an anti-balance tab. It still pretty much looks the same, uh, but it's all the way up on the top of the tail here. Now, why did they do that? Uh, well, according to Piper, it was to reduce vibration through the yoke and also to reduce the effects on trim when extending gear and flap. Now, um, that's all well and good. Uh, it sounds lovely, but in reality, I think it had more to do with um, styling and looking cool than it did <laughs> with improving the aircraft's flight dynamics. Um, because at that time, a lot of Piper aircraft were adopting a T-tail. You had the Seminole, uh, you had the delightful Piper Tomahawk, which is an aircraft uh, plenty of uh, people have plenty to say about in the GA community, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> and uh, you had the Turbo Lance and the regular Lance and all sorts of aircraft were being converted to, to have this T-tail. And most of it uh, really was just the styling language. Piper kind of wanted a whole fleet of T-tail aeroplanes. Uh, and as we know, all Piper aeroplanes are essentially the same plane um, <laughs> with a few basic modifications. <laughs> I'm just joking, but uh, yeah, uh, as we know, Piper like everything to look the same, and um, they try to kind of squeeze the T-tail onto everything. Um, now, the there were, as I said, some advantages to the T-tail. The However, there were plenty more disadvantages, and I feel that now is probably the right time to talk about why uh, I don't like the Arrow 4, and it is all to do with this thing here. Now, first of all, let's uh, flip over to the good old Photoshop here and have a look at my beautiful piece of artwork here. Uh, I've got a little screen grab of the Arrow uh, Turbo Arrow 3, just here. And as you can see, I have drawn on the propeller slipstream um, that you get coming back, uh, or the prop wash, as it's sometimes called, coming back from the propeller uh, on the takeoff roll. And as you can see, it's flowing over the top of the uh, lovely standard uh, stabilizer, which is fixed down on the bottom of the fuselage, uh, or the tip of the fuselage here. Um, it's getting the benefit of all that air flowing past it. And that basically is, uh, is increasing its, its effectiveness. Uh, it means that it's nice and sensitive. Uh, it feels nice and weighty as soon as you set the power and you have plenty of authority. Uh, it allows you to raise the nose um, on a soft field takeoff to take some of the weight off of the nose gear. And it also allows you to rotate the aircraft at a relatively low start, um, VR of 65 knots. Uh, now let's have a look at what the Arrow 4 is like. And here we go again with a, another lovely screen grab with my incredible art skills in full effect here. And <laughs> as you can see, the prop slipstream is just passing harmlessly underneath the horizontal tail surface here. So it's getting none of the benefit of that added airflow from the propeller. And what that means is you have much less nose authority at low air speeds and most critically on the takeoff roll. So for example, if you're on a grass strip, a bumpy strip, and you wanna raise the nose up um, as soon as possible to take the weight off the nose wheel, you're gonna find that very difficult to do. And that's the same sort of thing that you experience on all uh, single engine T-tail aircraft. They do not like rough strips. Because of that um, reduced nose authority, it also means the aircraft has to have a faster VR as well. It has to rotate at a higher speed. So the VR for the Arrow 4 is 75 knots. So it's 10 knots faster. And it can actually be as high as 77, depending on the weight of the aircraft. So what this means is that you are going to take up a bunch more runway. Now, that sounds bad as it is, but believe me it gets worse when you rotate this aircraft and it starts to pitch back down this way as you come back on the yoke all of a sudden the tail goes in to the airflow and the tail goes from being not hugely effective to being really really effective so what can happen is that you pull pull back a little bit um, Hard, well, a little bit harder than you normally would if you're used to a regular arrow because you're trying to get, achieve that same sort of rate of rotation as you're used to with the regular arrow. And you're pulling and pulling and you'll get it into this airflow and all of a sudden 
you're pulling too much and the nose will whip up, the tail will possibly strike the ground. More likely, the aeroplane will kind of drag itself off the ground. It might stall and you bash back down again and it all looks very, very embarrassing because potentially you have to reject the takeoff. Hopefully you've got enough room to stop because if you haven't, it's going to get pretty messy. Um, and a very similar problem happens when you're landing an Arrow 4. You're coming in at a relatively high angle attack, especially if you're doing a flapless approach, for example. Um, you've not got a great deal of uh, elevator authority and all of a sudden you get into the flare and your elevator suddenly feels completely different and you can sort of drag the nose too high, stall the aircraft above the runway, smack it down. It's all very embarrassing. Um, and it requires a specific technique which is different to every other version of the Arrow. So if you're going to go out and fly an Arrow 4, really you need uh, a few hours of getting used to it and flying the aircraft at different air speeds, low air speeds especially, to get used to this T-tail configuration. Now, add all of that to what I was just saying about the Turbo Arrow and how it's a tricky aircraft on takeoff because you've got all this engine to manage and therefore it takes your attention away from steering and pitching at the right airspeed. So you've got an aircraft which is tricky to manage on takeoff and you put the T-tail on it and you make it even trickier to manage on takeoff. Good job, Piper. Um, <laughs> so essentially, uh, the Turbo Arrow is, um, especially the Turbo Arrow 4, has a bit of a bad reputation amongst GA pilots as um, a, a, a bit of a stinker and a bit of a difficult aeroplane to manage. When this aircraft first came out, a lot of them were suffering engine failures. And it's simply because people weren't managing the engine correctly because they were concentrating too hard on trying not to crash off the runway um, <laughs> or stall the aeroplane uh, a few feet above the ground or whatever other myriad uh, mistakes you can make with this aircraft. Um, so really, it's, uh, it's not one of my favorites. And personally, I don't think the T-tail looks very nice. I might get a few uh, nasty comments for saying that. <laughs> I think the, the low tail is a lot nicer looking. I know, I know a lot of people are fans of, of the T-tail look and think it looks great, but just from a personal point of view, I don't think it's as nice. Um, so yeah, Turbo Arrow, uh, get thee behind me Satan. That's where uh, that came from. I do have a f uh, quite a few hours in the Turbo Arrow for the T-tail Turbo Arrow. Uh, like I said, I was doing a conversion with a chap who is used to uh, a regular arrow. Um, so I do know uh, the benefits. and it is an, a, It's a fun aeroplane. It's a challenging aeroplane. Um, and once you get to grips to, with this one in Microsoft Flight Simulator, um, I'm sure you'll have a lot of fun with it. Spoiler alert. I'm not going to bash it too hard. Anyway, um, <laughs> that's the historical real-world aircraft segment complete. You can breathe a deep sigh of relief now. Uh, we can start to have a look at this aeroplane in the simulator. Now, uh, you've already seen the Arrow 3. I've been showing up that off uh, a little bit earlier. We'll go back to that and have a look at some of the uh, liveries, but we'll do the Arrow 4 to start with, um, and we'll just have a quick look around it first in the hangar. And as you can see, uh, the texture job that they have done is very, very good indeed. You can see the Hartzell propeller stickers on here optional three bladed propeller on the turbo arrow standard fitted with a two blade uh, but the uh, this one has a three now one thing i've noticed uh, as you can see with the sun shining on it through the hangar door here is that the panel lines really tend to kind of stand out there's a, there's a bit of a shadow down the panel lines if i look compare on the other side the other side looks fine but as soon as the sun starts shining on it you get these really sort of quite prominent lines on the aircraft, so I think that's probably a little bit of a bug. We'll probably work that out pretty fast, given how good Just Flight are at um, improving things and how rapidly they roll out updates for their products. Uh, so I wouldn't be too worried about that. I suspect that's going to get fixed very soon. Overall textures of the aeroplane very, very good. Um, it's the traditional uh, Just Flight weathered look. The aircraft has dirt and little chips and scratches and all sorts of stuff all over it. Uh, you can see a few uh, little chips just on the intake here. Um, and it all adds to, to making the aircraft look um, lived in and a little bit tiny, tiny bit beaten up. It's still a pretty nice looking aeroplane. It's certainly a lot nicer than some of the things that I've flown over the years. Um, 
but it uh, it just goes to make the aeroplane look a little bit more lived and a little bit more part of the real world rather than a, a really sort of box fresh shiny shiny thing which a lot of people appreciate um, I can appreciate both sides of things I like shiny stuff too um, but this is certainly one of the uh, the more sort of weathered up realistic looking uh, models and I can certainly appreciate that um, I guess if you get really really close it's I wouldn't say it's quite as sharp as, for example, the Caronado aeroplanes are, uh, which is something which uh, also applies to the Arrow 3. It is very, very good, um, but it is not the absolute best that you will see in Microsoft Flight Simulator. Um, that said, it is not um, mediocre and it is not bad by any stretch of the imagination. It is very, very good. It is not just not uh, the absolute best, in my opinion. Uh, so let's have a look at uh, some of these liveries. So we've got Bog M, the <laughs> this very interesting green, uh, white, red, and uh, white uh, gr green, white, red, uh, and blue striped scheme. Um, bit of a funny looking aeroplane here, but yeah, cool. UK registered. Got a Delta register, German aircraft. It's quite nice. Oscar Echo. I think it's Austrian. I don't know. I'll flash it up uh, on the screen. What the nationalities of these aircraft are. Well, it might be Australian. <laughs> I don't know. Airlink, your private airline. Imagine you book a flight on an airline and it's a Piper Arrow. I'd be very disappointed. Um, <laughs> okay, man. I like this one. This is a great looking livery. This is similar to the one that I flew. The one that I flew had a gorgeous dark blue and white uh, colour scheme. Very, very sexy looking aeroplane. November registered. Good old US registered aircraft. This is quite a retro looking scheme. Really nice. Like the uh, retro looking Piper liveries. Very cool. And there's a custom one at the end there which basically just shows your own custom reg. So let's uh, now have a look at the... In fact, before we go to the three, let's have a look inside. This is... <laughs> this is awful, but this is exactly what Arrow 4s look like inside. It is absolutely a product of the late 80s with this ghastly brown beige velour and beige panel. It looks awful. And <laughs> just like I've done a fantastic job of recreating the PTSD that I feel every time I get into an Arrow 4 and I have to look at this god-awful interior. Uh, thankfully the Turbo Arrow 4 that I flew had been re-interiored and had a, a much nicer uh, black and grey sort of theme going on, but I have flown non-Turbo Arrow 4s that still have this just horrible <laughs> interior colouring uh, and it still scars me to this day. Right, let's uh, have a look at the three now. So, a nice November registered aircraft here. Another Delta registered German aircraft. Can't quite read the uh, reg on this one, it's quite funny. And massive turbo on the cowling, just in case you forget. Don't forget, everybody, it's turboed. Cool looking colour scheme. I like this one. Go back. <laughs> G registered. I like the, the, the blues and whites. This is a little bit of a lighter blue. More of a royal blue, I think you'd uh, call it. Not sure what's going on with those tie downs. Very nice. Hotel Bravo. I'm going to have to look up what country that is because I don't have a clue. Oh, it's Swiss, isn't it? Because there's a huge Swiss flag on the tail. Duh. Very nice looking, uh, smart, business-like grey with a few pinstripes on the side. Very nice. Victor Hotel. Registered. Again, don't know what country that is, but I'll look it up. So I at least can put it on some text on the screen. But yeah, this one's very nice, smart looking, minimalist livery. Let's have a quick look inside this one. So this one's got a much more palatable 
uh, sky blue. It's still velour. It's still very much a 70s-esque uh, thing. You get a much nicer grey panel in this aircraft here. Uh, the panel itself you will no doubt recognize from the Arrow 3 if you've got that aircraft or if you've watched my review of the Arrow 3. It's basically the same story with a few key differences, obviously between the uh, the turbo and the normally aspirated. Um, you've got a different manifold pressure gauge. Um, you've got a few different switches. The fuel pump is different. Uh, the Arrow 4 has a different light setup because it doesn't have a beacon light. Uh, there's also a um, primer pump up here, uh, different annunciator lights. You've got a light for the overboost warning up there. Uh, same, or at least a similar yoke with the uh, with the timer here. Uh, a little bit less weathered inside than the Arrow 3. Uh, it says on their website that's to uh, simulate the look of a privately owned aircraft rather than a flying school aircraft. And as uh, an employee of a flying school, I can certainly appreciate the fact that flying school aeroplanes are generally a lot more beaten up. Um, something else you'll, you may notice is the fact that we have this lovely GTN 750 integrated into the panel. Now, as default, uh, the aircraft comes with the usual options that the Arrow 3 has in terms of radios. You've got the, a bunch of these ancient uh, 25 kilohertz spacing radios, which aren't even legal in the UK anymore, uh, most places. Um, as an option and the ancient GPS 100 uh, which is functional but not hugely functional. Uh, you have the default Garmin 530, Garmin 430 setup or you now have the option of this thing. Now this is a third party completely free mod depicting the uh, Garmin GTN 750 uh, touchscreen GPS system and the aim of this uh, mod is to provide as much of the real-world functionality of this device as they possibly can in Microsoft Flight Simulator and they are already doing a fantastic job. In fact, I think I might have to do a whole video just on this thing um, just because it is very, very good. It requires a bit of setting up, but once you've got it set up, it's a lot of fun. So I'm going to be showcasing some of the things you can do on this thing. Um, Manif uh, aircraft manufacturers like, or developers, should I say, like Just Flight and Carinado have been kind enough to uh, include an integration option for this thing, obviously because they're just as impressed as the rest of us are with how good this thing is. Anyway, uh, that's the aircraft in the hangar, uh, inside and outside, and also a little bit of background about the real thing. Let's shut up gabbing, uh, let's load it into the sim, and let's do some flying, shall we? Okay, so here we are in the simulator with our lovely uh, Czech Republic registered um, Arrow 4. Uh, I've gone with uh, this one because I um, I really like this blue and white uh, color scheme, and like I said in the hangar. I've also gone for the three, ra uh, sorry, the four rather than the three, uh, because I wanted to showcase some of the handling characteristics of this aeroplane. Uh, which are different to the Arrow 3 that we flew last time. So the Turbo Arrow 3 in this package, I've flown it, uh, I've tested it, and it's basically just like flying, mostly just like flying a turbocharged uh, Arrow 3. It's a little bit different because it's got a heavier engine, uh, so it handles very slightly differently, but uh, it is essentially um, very similar to the aircraft we've already tested on this channel. So I thought I'd go for the different one so I could show you some of the differences uh, that you get in real life, which are... Uh, approximated pretty well in this uh, simulated version. So let's uh, go to the external camera here and have a look at what she looks like with the in-sim lighting. It always looks a lot better uh, in the sim than it does sat in that hangar with the funny lighting and it does look very very nice indeed. Gorgeous colour scheme, uh, lovely textures Anything other than sort of shove your face on the wing distance, the uh, the textures really do stand up to anything else in the simulator, in my opinion. Lovely looking thing. You've also got our little external uh, add-ons, items, ground handling bits and pieces uh, attached. So that's the tie-downs here, uh, the chocks. Um, very privileged to have a set of chocks for every single wheel. We usually just have ones with a nose wheel where I uh, work. And we've also got the... Uh, lovely little tow bar here which is much more like the ones I'm used to. The uh, Carinado one looks far too fancy for uh, for my tastes. Uh, we've also got the single entry door open and the little baggage drawer here 
and the uh, oil filler flap here. They could have done with adding a little strap to the top of this actually, because in real life, you see this little thing here? It's actually a little piece of material and uh, you can unclip it from here and attach it to a little uh, lug which is up here, uh, sticking out of the aeroplane. It's, it just looks like the, the other side of a popper kind of thing. I don't know what you call it. Uh, <laughs> it's called a popper in the UK. You take it off and you clip it on there and it basically keeps the baggage door open. Um, they could have probably added that actually. It, because at the moment it's just holding itself open by the power of magic. Anyway, so that's what the outside of the, aer the aeroplane looks like uh, with the proper sim lighting. And this is what the inside looks like. Um, the panel is absolutely excellent. I mean, you can zoom right into that. You can see the screws with the the wear marks on the screws that they used to unscrew them. I mean, it, it, it is really, really good. Um, the carpet and the seats. Horrible, horrible beige velour seats. The curtains in the back there. And all of this stuff works. So if you want to turn your uh, overhead cabin air off or anything like that, uh, you most certainly can. And this is all represented in the external model of the airplane. So if you move these, you can then go outside and see that they have moved on the external as well. Which is very nice indeed. So we'll, uh, in fact, can we put it this way? Will it let us? No. I usually have them pointing forwards in the real aeroplane. Anyway, uh, we'll get rid of the external elements now because we're going to go fly and we're going to close everything up here as well. So, quick notes uh, about the flight conditions. Uh, as we always do in this channel, we've set the uh, weather up with, uh, bait with a clear day, no wind, and ISA standard atmosphere, 15 degrees temperature uh, on the ground. And uh, 2 9 and 9 2 inches of mercury, or 10 13 if you are from Euroland, as I am, uh, hectopascals of pressure on the ground as well. So, um, all standard conditions which will make it easier for us to assess the performance of this aeroplane. I have set us up with just one pilot on board of a moderate weight, and oh, in fact, I can show you here. Uh, ooh, okay, let's change that. So full fuel and a moderate weight pilot, uh, which gives us um, 1147 kilos, which is just over 2,500 pounds, 2,530, I think. Um, so I have run our takeoff performance graphs at that weight and for this temperature and sea level, because we are basically at sea level at Doncaster here. Um, and that should give us a rate of climb, and I'll get onto that in a sec. So first of all, let's get the aircraft going. Now, I can use the in-game checklist, and as you can see, there is a really, really extensive in-game checklist, which you can use uh, and look at all the items. You can bring that up in blue there. It's lovely. Um, <laughs> so if you're not familiar with the aircraft or where anything is, you can use that uh, and familiarize yourself with where all of these items actually are. Um, I'm not going to use that one. I'm going to use a real-world uh, Arrow 4 checklist, which I have to hand, uh, just because I always do that. It's not uh, because of any shortcomings with the in-game one. The in-game one is excellent, but I always use a real-world checklist on these tests, and I'm not going to change because, uh, I don't know. <laughs> because consistency, damn it. Um, so we're going to be using the real-world checklist. Anyway, uh, before, um, without further ado, Let's uh, crack on. So our before start checklist we're going to start with. We're going to assume that we've done all of the walk around and the pre-flight internal and all that stuff. So before start checklist, seat belts are fastened. That's fine. Avionics master switch. We don't have one of those. Uh, parking brake is set. So the parking brake here is pulled out. Gear switch, uh, gear selector is in the down position there. Fuel selector lowest tank. Both the tanks are the same. We're on the left tank to start. Uh, alternate air switch is in the closed position there. Battery and alternator. We're going to do this on the honeycomb yoke. And flip those on. Uh, Anti-collision lights. It says here, put the anti-coals on. I do not uh, believe in turning anti-coals on on the ground uh, for taxi and that sort of stuff. We don't have a beacon on this aircraft. I may have mentioned that in the hangar. Um, all we have to identify our position are the nav lights or the strobes. And I don't put strobes on the taxiway. It's really bad practice. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to ignore the checklist on that one and just put the navs on. Uh, nav lights as required. Yes, they are on. So for engine starts, we're going to go mixture full rich. And I'm going to do this on my joystick control here. Uh, propeller full forwards. 
which it is. Uh, throttle full forward and auxiliary pump off, which it is. Right, primer, I'm going to give it four seconds of primer. Now there is a, an entire chart to tell you how long you should use your primer for, depending on the temperature and ambient air pressure. Uh, I have worked it out roughly for today's conditions, and it's four seconds. So I'm going to give it four of these. One, two, three, four. And you can see the fuel flow popping up there, and the fuel pressure also pops up as you press that. Uh, now we're going to close the throttle fully. And it says prop area clear, so I'd be shouting clear prop out that little storm window at the top of my voice. And start to engage, and then we are going to on the start sequence. So, unlike the um, Arrow 3, which went for the standard fuel injected um, start process of mixture in the full lean position, then throw it forward when the engine starts, uh, we're going to leave this full uh, forward. Uh, Mag's already on both, so I'm just going to crank the starter and she should start up. Fingers crossed. There we go. So, straight away, we check. Uh, <laughs> okay. I don't think I gave it enough throttle. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ignore what the checklist says and crack the throttle open a little bit. And try it at that. Give it a little bit of throttle. There we go. Now it's caught. I go for 1200 RPM. We've got the starter warning light has gone out. RPM 1200. And oil pressure is up into the green. Now, some checklists do say bring the RPM up to 1500 to help the oil warm up. Um, but we're going to be taking our time with this checklist, so I think we can do without that. So, after start checklist, avionics can come on. We've already got our GTN 750 popped up here, but we're going to turn on our... If we can. There we go. Our uh, COM2 going to turn nav 2 on as well. We're also going to turn on the DME and the ADF and immediately that's deciding to give us an ident. So I'm going to go audio panel here and uh, oh, maybe you can't. Interesting. Alright, shut up then. Find the click spot for that. There we go. So that automatically turns it on on the audio panel. As you can see here, that your audio controls are integrated into the GTN 750. I've got COM1 uh, set for listening and speaking and I can ident any of my nav radios uh, using these buttons there, so it's all very nice. Uh, so we've got those turned on, radios uh, set, so um, I would be setting up with uh, Doncaster's tower frequency there, uh, and the radar on standby, I'm not going to bother doing that because we don't have any ATC in the sim today, however I am going to set the nav radios up, we've got 11095 which is the Doncaster ILS. Um, as usual, it's not uh, picking it up at the moment. It will probably pick it up when we get onto the runway. It's just, I don't know, some strange Microsoft Flight Simulator bug. The DME is working, and that is set to uh, work off of NAV 1, as you can see here. And it's giving us 0.7. Uh, so we may actually be able to get an ident off this. There we go. Let's see. Yeah, NAV 1 is identing, actually. Okay, fair enough. We've got an audio ident from uh, the DME and the uh, NAV 1 radio. We've already listened to um, NAV 2 when it was uh, shouting at us. So that's fine. I'm going to go to 3. three three eight on there, which is the Foxtrot November Yankee NDB and... Uh, Very quiet. Hmm. Anyway, it is identing. That's Foxtrot November Yankee. The needle is pointing at the beacon over here. And now, if we go to antenna, that should park on the right wing. It doesn't. Uh, I think that's probably a failing with Microsoft Flight Simulator more than with this aeroplane, but it is uh, something they could sort out in the future. So that's our nav and com radios checked and set. Let's move on to the next item. Uh, transponder set to standby, we've got 7,000 standby. Circuit breakers check all in, and that is of course important on this aeroplane because the circuit breakers all work and they are all in there. 
uh, mixture leaned for taxi, so it does recommend leaning the mixture a little bit for taxi. Uh, so we will bring it back just a touch to save a bit of fuel and save the life of the spark plugs. Uh, and then we are ready to go. So before we do go, I'm just going to show you a little feature. Now, obviously, we wouldn't be doing this with the engine running in real life. Uh, because that would be a great way to not only use, lose your tow bar, but also lose your arms. If I idle the throttle, release the parking brake, and just hit Shift P, you can see our little tow bar comes back for the pushback, which is a great little feature. And once you've stopped, it goes away again. So uh, I thought I'd show you that, because that is a great little piece of realism, I guess. Um, just going to check our altimeters. In fact, they're not set, so I'm going to check those. I'm just going to check our flight instruments, even though that wasn't on the checklist. Uh, so we've got uh, subscale working, and it's reading zero, erect and uh, upright, and the bars are lined up with the white there. Set to pressure, and it's reading within 50 feet of airfield elevation, which is 50 feet. Wings are level, balls in the middle. That's agreeing with that, and uh, we're going to use runway 20 for departure, as we usually do. So let's set up the course deviation indicator. On to uh, two zero if we can get that, and the same with the heading bug. And vertical speed indicates indicator is reading zero, and we'll do a quick check of our enunciator panel that is all clear. So let's go for the taxi then. So idle throttle, release the parking brake, and off we go. So just going to give it a bit of a wiggle on my rudder pedals because they uh, sometimes take a little while to wake up. And I'm going to use the uh, diff brakes to make us a nice tight turn here. There we go. Now I would say the weight of the, the taxi, like the weight of the aircraft as you're taxiing, uh, does feel pretty good. Uh, something else that feels pretty good is the noise it makes. I was actually uh, parked up in front of a Turbo Arrow for today, and I can uh, tell you that it really does sound just like this. Probably because the sounds have been recorded from the real aeroplane. Inside, obviously a lot quieter, but still very good, very atmospheric. You've got lots of other sort of background noises as well as the uh, sound of the engine. It's a little bit quieter than the Arrow 3, that's just because of the uh, the turbocharger saps some of the noise out of the exhaust system. It's also got a longer exhaust um, that sticks out back here, instead of the very, very short twin pipes that the Arrow 3 has that tend to shoot a lot of flames out sometimes. Um, pop that window open, you can uh, hear what it sounds like with the window. They have actually recorded a specific sound for when you open that window up, which is very cool closed again. You could also, if we crack the top there, you can hear it makes an, a slightly different noise as well. So they've recorded all of those different sounds, which is very, very cool. So we're going to do our usual, we're going to pull up uh, towards Alpha 7 here and turn the aircraft off the centre line of the taxiway and do our power checks. And we're going to make sure that our oil temperature is up here. I'm going to regret not running it up to 1500 rpm but it does look like we do have some oil temperature uh, very very temperature sensitive engine both uh, in terms of overheating and overcooling so you've got to keep a very close eye on what your temperatures are before you do anything slightly energetic shall we say with the uh, engine rpm so parking brake set rpm back up to 1200 and we are ready for our power checks Okay, so parking brake set, fuel selector, we're going to change tanks, there we go, uh, we're going to check our mixture up to full rich now, there we go, throttle, we're going to cover the brakes, and we're going to go up to 2000 RPM, so gently raise the RPM. Up to 2,000 T's and P's are still good. Oil temperature is not getting too hot, but we're going to make sure we don't do this for too long. Uh, Magneto is going to check for a max drop of 150 RPM. So let's uh, zoom in a little bit so we can see that better. Refine the throttle to date. It's a little bit better than we have. There's left mag. And we've got about, about 100 RPM. Back to both. 
That's taking a while to recover, isn't it? Might just be my throttle wiggling all over the place and spoiling uh, our nice engine test. And we're going to go right mag. Now, normally this would happen a little bit quicker than this. It's taking quite a while for it to drop. We'll call about 50 RPM. And we'll go back to both. And it's recovering back to 2,000. Normally it's, it's quicker than that. Uh, so I don't know if that's something that they can change. We're going to do the prop exercise. So as we always do with a cold engine, we're going to exercise the prop. First one's going to be increase in manifold pressure, decrease in RPM. Okay, we did get a slight rise in manifold pressure and a drop in RPM. Real life, that would probably move at least sort of three inches. So probably need to change that a little bit. If they can, I think it's probably a Microsoft Flight Simulator ism. Second one is going to be checking for any oil over the top. Nothing seen. And the third one is going to be checking the oil pressure fluctuates as you move the lever, which it does. They've actually smoothed that out. It looks very nice now. Uh, alternate air check. So we're looking for no change in manifold pressure or RPM when we switch to the alternate, but we're not going to do it for too long because that is unfiltered air, which you don't want to be using on the ground. Annunciator panel, we're going to check. All the lights are working and it is clear. Vacuum 4.8 to 5.1. And uh, we are looking at about 4.8, which is fine. It's on the lower limit. And we're going to fully close the throttle out. Gentle when we do this because we don't want to cause any backfires, even though they do sound awesome. That noise, so good. Get the sort of shaky sound. Everything's vibrating around at low RPM. And uh, we should be looking for about six to 800 RPM here. And we're getting about 700, so that's perfect. 650, something like that. So we're going to go back up to 1200 RPM now. Our ground idle, which helps keep that cooling air flowing through the engine. Let's take a quick look at our oil temperature. It's still uh, just below the middle, so that is fine. Uh, throttle is set back to 1200. Yeah, manifold pressure line. Okay, so we could uh, hit the, the drain line on here uh, if uh, we had one. Okay, so we'll do our before takeoff checklist now. So flight controls, let's get this back. Maybe I'll forget, I'll remember the stopwatch today. Uh, so left hand down, left side up, other side opposite, right hand down, right side up, other side opposite. And we can't see our tail plane, but we just hope it's doing it. So full aft, full forward. Back to the middle and everything else is everything is back to neutral. Uh, flight instruments, so we have, we're just going to double check that that is still agreeing uh, up there. Everything else is still stable and level. We've already done the full flight control check. Uh, radios checked and set, we've already sorted that. So yes, we do have the ILS. Uh, we've got Ottringham on standby, which isn't going to be a huge amount of use, but we're not going to be really using those uh, too much this flight. And comm radios we're not going to be using. Uh, flap set for takeoff, we're going to use uh, zero flap for this takeoff. And uh, trim is set, so let's check that our trim is in the neutral position, which it is. And uh, auxiliary fuel pump, we're going to. Uh, now, normally it does say in, in a lot of these checklists, um, don't use the auxiliary fuel pump for takeoff. Um, I have always put the aux fuel pump on low. Um, as I would with the regular arrow in these aeroplanes. So I don't know if I'm doing something spectacularly wrong here, uh, but it just feels wrong to me not being, not using any kind of fuel pump as a backup at this point. So I am going to put uh, the fuel pump on low, and you can see we get a little um, amber light telling us the AUX fuel pump is on. Uh, takeoff briefing. Well, I'm not going to give you a takeoff briefing because I think you are more than familiar with this airport at this point. Door and window. Yeah, the storm window is closed and uh, we are closed and latched there. Nothing open in the cargo compartment at the back because that's going to get very ugly if it is. Uh, parking brake released. And then it's our lineup check after that. And we do that from memory. So let's put the checklist away and talk very quickly about uh, our takeoff performance. So at the current weight, uh, with maximum continuous power set, the aircraft should achieve about 1150 feet per minute. Remember book figures, it says, you know, we don't compensate for a worn aircraft, but they, they always kind of go on the safe side. Um, so I would not be surprised if the aircraft slightly outperforms uh, the book figure. But by slightly, I mean by sort of one, 200 feet per minute, no more than that. Um, and that's that. And then we're going to go up into the cruise. We're going to go up to, we'll go, well, first of all, we'll go to about 3,000 feet. 
uh, we'll set max continuous uh, cruise power which is going to be uh, 33 inches of manifold pressure and uh, 2450 rpm and we should be getting about 140 knots out of the airplane at that altitude then we'll go a bit higher and we see how the uh, true airspeed increases with altitude and how the turbo arrow gives us that advantage um, and we will test some other power settings so we'll test the economy setting which is going to be 28 inches of manifold pressure and 2200 rpm which should give us around about 130 knots uh, true at that sort of altitude then we'll do our usual general handling um, regime which includes clean stall um, might do a, a full approach config stall as well just to check the characteristics with all the uh, gear and flap hanging out do a couple of steep turns and then we will uh, or i will show you the navigation capabilities of this thing and the very limited um piper auto control 3b autopilot which is the same uh autopilot unit in the arrow 3 so don't be thinking you've got some kind of fancy 3d uh, autopilot system Unfortunately not, uh, but I'll show you how that works for anyone not familiar with it. We'll go over to Nottingham, we'll do the join, and we're going to do three circuits, a full flap, standard touch and go, a flapless touch and go, and a glide approach to land. So, without further ado, let's idle throttle, release the parking brake. Now the takeoff procedure in this aircraft, I'm gonna hold it on the brakes, I'm going to set a little bit under takeoff power, which is going to be 41 inches of manifold pressure. I'm going to let it settle, and then I'm going to release the brakes and start the aircraft moving. Then, as the aircraft accelerates, I'm going to add that tiny bit of power in to go all the way up to 41, hopefully without illuminating the overboost light. Uh, let's do our lineup check before I forget. So, stopwatch is running, approach path is clear, transponder can go to altitude reporting. Peter heat on and all of the lights can go on as well. Let's try and get that center line sorted since I always seem to miss it. There we go. I'm going to hold the tow brakes because parking brake is a no no on an active runway. We'll go back up to 1200 RPM initially. Just check the uh, DI is aligned and it's agreeing runway 20, and we've got 20 on the uh, instrument here. T's and P's are all in the green. All temperatures dropped a little bit, so we'll keep an eye on that, but it's still above the minimum. And I'm going to start ramping the power up towards takeoff. Nice and gentle. You can hear the noise is really ramping up. The turbo's kicking in. I'm going to go for about there. The temperature's rising rapidly. I'm going to release the brakes and away we go. Plenty of right rudder to counteract the propeller slipstream. And then I'm going to push the throttle forward that last little way. Now we've got takeoff power set. Now I'm going to give it a little bit of pitch at 65, which is the normal arrow rotation speed. You'll see how heavy it is. That's nothing happening there. So that shows the difference between the T-tail and the regular. There's 75 and we're easily off the ground at 75, but obviously quite a bit more runway used. Initially, I'm gonna to pitch to about 87 for the climb with gear. Trim usage, very, very important in this aircraft. Because of that, slightly less than uh, brilliant elevator authority okay insufficient remain remaining we're past 300 feet above ground level gear selected up and we are now gear up and lights out we're going to accelerate the aircraft to the vy climb speed which is 97 knots and let's keep an eye on our rate of climb so we're getting about 1200 feet per minute which is absolutely perfect about 1250 so it's about oh, going back to 1150 there so it's about spot on where i'd expect it i mean would you expect anything else from just flight honestly now it does say in the pilot's operating handbook that you only maintain this full power climb for as long as it takes to get above any obstacles on the climb out and it's basically all to do with temperature management as you can see our oil temperature has crept up quite a lot so let's get it back to the uh, climb power setting which is going to be 33 inches of manifold pressure and uh, 2575 rpm we've got that set and we're also going to accelerate to 103 knots 
And as you can see, the climb performance at this altitude is not exactly stellar. Uh, it is probably, all things considered, a little bit worse than the regular Arrow. And that's mostly to do with the added weight of the turbocharged engine. Down at this altitude, the turbocharger really isn't giving you too much of an advantage. Uh, so it's not a low altitude bird. It needs to get its head in the clouds uh, for you to get any, any kind of advantage over it. So let's climb up to 3,000 feet first of all, and we shall see what sort of performance we get. Okay, so here we are now, level at uh, 3,000 feet just about. I have set our cruise power of 33 inches and uh, 2450 RPM. That uh, balance out a little bit, and it's giving us uh, a tiny bit under 140 knots. So that's pretty much what we expect, because remember that's indicated, not true. Uh, I'm just going to do our after takeoff checks. So flaps are up, landing light, sorry, is off. Engine T's and P's are in the green, attitude and trim are set, and the fuel pump can come on. So she is performing very nicely to book figures. As you can see, we're about 10 degrees at 3,000 feet, so let's set the uh, 3,000 on the 10 degree mark here and you can see 140 knots bang on is what we're doing so that's perfect so before we get too settled at this altitude let's pop it up to uh, let's go for 6,000 feet let's see what the performance is like up there so we'll set the climb pop forward slightly And I'll see you up at 6,000 feet. Okay, here we are leveling off at 6,000 feet. Trim the aircraft. Now, of course, in the UK, this would normally be flight level 60. That'd be setting uh, standard, which is going to sound a bit mad to you uh, US guys who have a transition altitude of 18,000 feet. But we're weird in the UK. Okay, I'm just letting the aircraft accelerate. And then I'm going to that power to about, well it's 33.8, so let's go for about 34 on the gauge and 2400 RPM. And we're also going to bring the power back, the fuel flow, sorry. And I'm looking at that e, uh, the EGT gauge just to the right of the throttle quadrant there. I'm looking for something that's slightly rich of peak, so we'll go for about there. I think it's about 15 gallons now, which uh, sounds about right. Now, our true airspeed at this altitude with this power setting should give us about 150 knots. So let's see. We've got uh, about two or three degrees here. So let's get to 6,000 feet. Basically on there. And it's giving us about uh, 158, a little bit fast. More like 155. About five knots is well within uh, the window of variance, and as you can see, it's settling down a little bit now as I'm uh, flying the aeroplane a little bit more accurately. Pop over to the uh, map here. We see we've got 155, 156 on the ground speed, of course, in nil wind. Uh, that pretty much equates to our true airspeed. So that is pretty much on the money there. She's very slightly faster than the book, but like I said, the book is always adjusted uh, very conservatively. So I'm happy with that. Okay, so let's go for our cruise power setting. So I'm going to go left to right. I'm going to bring down the power to 28 inches of mercury on the manifold air pressure gauge while attempting to keep the airplane straight. Doing a great job of that. And I'm going to reduce the RPM 
to 2200 and that's a much more or a much less antisocial noise level so much nicer for your passengers assume you don't have uh, fancy noise cancelling headsets for all of them Send that out of it so the aircraft's slowly settling down It's taking quite a while for the aircraft to settle here. Just about settling out at about 125 uh, indicators, which is giving us 138 uh, true. Well, ground speed, but like I said, that pretty much equates to true when there's no wind. So again, a touch faster than what the book says we should be doing, which is just over 130 knots, but it's well within the window of variance acceptable window of variance. We've got a nice shiny clean aeroplane so that should be helping us uh, achieve some quite decent cruise speeds. So I'm going to make a turn back to the north before we uh, get too far south. And then we shall go into our general handling regime. Okay, so let's set our aircraft up for the uh, clean stall procedure. So as you can see we've been going about 15 minutes so it's time for a tank change so we'll do that as well. So Height is sufficient to be recovered before 3,000 feet, though we, we do have plenty of height. Airframe is clean. Engine T's and P's, we are looking good in that respect. I'm going to put the fuel pump on low as an added bit of security. And uh, we'll just cycle our alternate air. Make sure there's no change in either of those. Safety and security, we're all strapped in, doors closed, nothing heavy in the back. Uh, T's and P's are all, like I said, good in the green. Location, uh, we're fine, clear of any active airfields, built to barriers, controlled airspace, danger zones, and normally I'd be doing a clearing turn, but we're not going to do that because we're in the sim on our own today. So I'm going to shove the mixture full forward, and as you can see there's no big change in RPM as you do that because it is a properly uh, modelled fuel injected engine in this aeroplane, very nicely done. I'm going to bring the power all the way back to idle, and I'm going to shove the prop full forward as well. And we're going to just bring that nose back. Now, as an effect of that T-tail, you are going to need a fair bit of trim to help you out with this manoeuvre. So I'm going to give her a fair bit of nose up trim until we hit about 80 knots. At that point, I'm not going to give her any more because we don't want to make the aircraft too difficult to recover from this manoeuvre. That would be uh, rather catastrophic. So there's our 80. I'm going to stop trimming there and just keep adding back pressure. And you can start to hear the buffet happening now. Stall Warner, heavy buffet, and the aircraft has stalled at that. Very, very, very benign. Uh, the nose just dropping a little bit. She's just mushing around. I'm going to relax the back pressure, select full power. Bear in mind, watch out for that overboost. So, again, another gotcha there. And trim the aircraft for the climb. We'll go for 97. And then reset climb power. 33.8 or 34, 25.75 RPM. There's 6,000 feet again, let's level off. And there we go, so that is a pretty much perfect arrow stall. Uh, the arrow four stall is pretty much exactly the same as the arrow three, uh, but you find you will need a bit more effort on the yoke uh, to get her to uh, stall properly, and that's exactly like the real aircraft, really. That uh, T-tail is not as effective as the old-fashioned low stabilizer. Okay, let's reset the aircraft in the cruise. And now we're going to reconfigure and go for a approach configuration stall. So speed below 133, slightly higher gear limiting speed on the arrow 4 for some reason. And uh, gear down. And we'll let that drag our speed back along with uh, pulling the power back a bit more. 
because we have a flat limiting speed of 108. So we've got to get below that. The gear is down three greens and we're pretty much coming to 108 now with a fair bit of trim to help. So speed check below 108 flaps one and off lap lever is just this big handbrake here in case you're wondering. Flaps two and flaps three. There's quite a big balloon as you bring the flaps in, which is very realistic to what the real arrow does. We'll try and stay on a northerly heading throughout this. And normally, um, CPL profile would only do this to the incipient stage, but we will stall the aircraft fully. Prop, power back, prop full forward, mixture is still full forward, and we're going to add a fair bit of nose up trim. We're already down at 80 knots, so I'm not going to add too much. We're going to stall at a lower nose attitude. There's the heavy buffet, there's the stall warner. Nose is dropping, high rate of descent. That is a textbook stall. The aircraft is very benign, just mushing towards the ground. I'm going to add that power. Careful not to overboost. Keeping on the uh, manifold air pressure gauge. See how tricky this is, managing all of this stuff. Uh, then set the aircraft back up in the climb. Bring off some of that trim that I piled in. And then reset the prop to 25, 75, pretty much uh, just below the red line there. And allow the aircraft to accelerate again. And once we've got the attitude set, we're going to go flat, gear, looking for positive climb now, positive climb we have, flat, and flap again, clean climb, accelerate to 97, and back we go to 6,000 feet, so stalls completed, tick in the box, and uh, very, very nicely done indeed from uh, Just Flight. They've modelled that pretty much perfectly. I didn't expect anything less from them, honestly, because the Arrow 3 was modelled pretty much perfectly as well. So we're going to go 28 and 22 again for that nice, comfy uh, cruise config. And once she's settled herself back out at about uh, 125, uh, indicated where she was last time we shall enter into our steep turns okay so she settled out 120 indicated 130 uh, or so true I have changed fuel tanks uh, off screen you might remember I said oh let's change fuel tanks during that hazel check and then I didn't do it which is typical me really uh, completely incompetent moron as usual <laughs> So let's do our steep turn. Let's uh, we'll go to the left. Um, much of a muchness which way we go. There's no traffic to look out for. We've uh, done a hazel check recently. So let's go straight in. So bank, balance with the pedals, and add that back pressure. I'm looking for a fair bit of back pressure required. Heavy aeroplane, the arrow, but very nice and stable once you've got that back pressure set. And I'm just looking for an attitude out the window. Maintain that attitude, air speed's looking good. I'm gonna add a tiny bit more manifold pressure to stop it slowing down too much. And she's coming around very nicely, very stably. Exactly what I'd expect from the real airplane. Really is a doddle, it's a steep turn. One of the really good handling characteristics of this aircraft. Ooh, don't let that nose drop. And I'm looking at the altimeter here to monitor my altitude keeping, not the vertical speed indicator, Vertical speed indicator has a lag, unless you're flying an air, airliner with an instantaneous VSI. I'm going to roll out a little bit early with a bit of opposite rudder to help. Relax that brake pressure, bring that power back to 28 inches again. And resettle the aircraft, 28, not 25, uh, back at our cruise altitude of 6,000 feet and on a northerly heading. So that is pretty much spot on. Well done, just fight again. Okay, so I've turned the aeroplane round. We're now on a southerly or a southwesterly heading, heading back towards uh, Nottingham. And I am going to demonstrate the wonderful autopilot system of this aircraft. So we're all set up with the heading bug aligned. I'm going to turn heading on there. The aircraft's nicely trimmed out, which means we should hit autopilot there. And the autopilot has control of the aeroplane. However, I still have, uh, to bring the yoke back, I still have control of the pitch. So the aircraft does need to be properly trimmed out to make this work. Now, 
If you want it to follow a route, the nav mode does work. Uh, it's not amazing, but it does work. Uh, I'm, I'm going to put a route in in a second. Once I have demonstrated, one more thing. So let's get rid of this uh, iPad it's sitting there. And allow me to demonstrate something that I wanted to show for quite a while on uh, the Arrow. That's the automatic gear extension system. Uh, and indeed the emergency gear extension. So you may have noticed this flashing amber light here. What that is telling us is that the automatic gear extension system of the aircraft is disabled. Now, the automatic gear extension system is a system which works from a separate pitot head outside the aircraft, and we can see it on the side here. Now, this thing uh, is a heated, completely separate pitot head to the normal one, which is under the wing here, which is just for operating this automatic gear extension system. The aim of the gear extension system is to stop your landing uh, gear up when you forget to put your wheels down, basically. Uh, and the way it works is that when you are uh, at a power setting of below 14 inches and an airspeed of below 108 knots, it will deploy your landing gear automatically. So first of all, we're going to turn it on. So it's you do that by unpinning the emergency gear lever, which is pinned into the fully up position now. So if we click it once to unpin it, that has now activated the automatic gear extension system. So I am now going to reduce power and allow the airspeed to decay. And as you can see, I've brought the power back below 14 inches of manifold pressure. So I'm gonna pitch to maintain. Autopilot's still on, but obviously I still have to do the pitch. I'm gonna let the airspeed bleed back and we're gonna keep an eye on this because at some point, a bit more power back, it's gonna deploy the gear. There we go, you can hear the gear going down now. Went at about uh, 90 knots or so. Gear down three green, you can see the lever is still in the up position there. I'm gonna add some power before we stall. And as soon as we go above 14 inches, gears retracted again. So, quite interesting. Go back again. There's the gear coming down again. So it could be a lifesaver, that one, but it also could be uh, a bit of a killer uh, for reasons I shall uh, go into at uh, perhaps a later date. Anyway, let's reset that power. Uh, we're not going to go too fast, though, because I want to demonstrate uh, another system that this aircraft has. That is, of course, the emergency gear extension system. So I'm just going to trim us out and go for about uh, sort of 90, 100 knots, something like that. And I'm going to get rid of the yoke on this side, if I can. There we go. Take some of that trim out. As we accelerate now. Okay, so I'm going to give us an artificial artificial gear um, gear pump failure by pulling the gear pump uh, circuit breaker. So now, if I select our landing gear down. As you can see, nothing is happening because we have a complete loss of the electrical hydraulic gear pump. Saw that trim, still trying to climb. There we go. Okay, so what we need to do to get the gear down is now simply select our emergency gear extender to the down position. And as we can see, our gear is now extending. We got one, we got two, we got three. We got fully deployed gear. So there you go, emergency gear extension is properly modelled in uh, this aeroplane, which is very, very cool indeed. Pop that back in, and I'm going to select uh, our emergency gear lever back all the way up. There we go, to turn our automatic gear extender back off, you see the blinking lights. I'm not going to do that, it's very stupid of me. <laughs> and we're going to raise the gear. Okay, so I'm just going to uh, turn the aircraft a little bit to uh, the west to give us a bit of an offset because we are getting quite close to 
uh, Nottingham. And I just want to show you how to put a route in the GTN 750 and how the aircraft follows it. So I'm going to bump the, uh, the power back up to where it should be and bring the fuel flow back again to just north of peak EGT. I'll get this trim sorted one day. It's kind of hard to do with the uh, autopilot in charge of the roll. How long have we been going? 30 minutes, it's time for a tank change. So it's all got the pump on. Let's go for the right tank. Fuel pressure is in the green and tank. We can go with the pump off now. Okay, cool. So, let's have a look at our uh, GTN 750 here. So, I'm just going to hit the direct two arrow on this side. And we can go to the tab that says nearest airport. And you can see it's giving us a whole bunch of nearby airports. You can see Nottingham is uh, on there. So, we're going to hit that. Activate. And there's our magenta line. Easy as that. If we wanted to put it in uh, manually, we could uh, click on the waypoint. Hit there and type the identifier in there. But we're not going to do that because it was on the uh, the nearby list. So let's get the aircraft turning in the right direction. As you can see, we've only got 10 miles to go and we have quite a lot of altitude to lose. Um, six and a half, or five and a half thousand feet. So that's going to be uh, 30 and a bit miles. Um, 31 and a half miles. Realistically, to get that done comfortably. So we're going to have to come down a little bit stupid like I'm going to bring the power back a fair bit and go for 2400 RPM to help our aircraft descend as quickly as possible. As you can see, the information popping up here gives you ETA, a direct track, which you should uh, turn this to. So let's go for 172. Uh, and the ground speed and you can change all of these so you can to the menu here and you can give yourself um, change fields so you can change that ETA to let's say we wanted um, let's say estimated time of arrival back in fact that's what we had before isn't it <laughs> oh, what an idiot. Uh, okay, so let's say instead of ETA we wanted... Um, oh, my days. Yeah, cross-track error. There we go. Beautiful. 1.7 uh, miles off track. So you can give all sorts of things on there. There's uh, What I was looking for, actually, on there was the wind. Because uh, you can get wind arrows on there, which are very useful for when you're flying approaches and holds and things like that. Okay, so we're just coming to the ACZ now, and uh, we're still a bit high, so I'll tell you what, let's do a standard overhead join to get rid of that uh, excess height. We're going to pop off the autopilot and heading mode and fly manually. We're going to level off at about 2,100 feet, which is 2,000 above airfield elevation. And uh, do a bit of a standard overhead join for runway 27. So left-hand turns only. We're going to fly down the runway, overhead the two seven numbers, and then uh, we're going to announce that we are in the overhead, descending dead sides. And as we come through the runway center line, we're going to come back on the power again. I'll we'll come back all the way down the gear warning horn, just let it leap to itself. to try to remain inside the ATZ. Now, one of the great things you can do on this, I'm always winged, you know, I can't put an OBS uh, line on this. Well, guess what you can do? 
with this. There's an OBS. Look at that. And we can change this to runway heading. 090. So coming around here, speed's coming down to about 100 knots, which is perfect. So I'm going to add a little bit of power in. Have a look out the left-hand side of the aircraft, looking to cross the runway at the right point there. So let's do a pre-joining check. Probably should have done that already, but anyway, fuel pump is on. Change tanks if we need to. Uh, we're okay since the last time we changed tanks. Radio is good. Mixture is full rich. Engine T's and P's are fine. Altimeter set, air fuel Q and H, DI's aligned. Radios are all set. We're all good. And we are into the circuit, so we've I've set, uh, well, I've set too high an RPM is what I've done. <laughs> but let's go 2200 uh, RPM at about 20 inches. That should give us about uh, 95 to 100 knots. And we're looking for about 950 feet, 800 foot circuits here at uh, Nottingham. And uh, it is a... We are on the QNH, so that means... Uh, we have to add airfield elevation to our altitude. So as you can see, the aircraft settled down at about 90 knots. Might want to add a little bit more, go for maybe 2200 RPM here. So the reason we lower our RPM to 2200 when we're in the circuit is just for noise abatement, to try and uh, not annoy the locals too much. 33 angler bank turn onto downwind, and then we'll do our pre-landing checks. And it's going to be a full flap approach for a touch and go. See how useful this OBS line is here. It really is cheating. Because it means you can completely cheat and line up on a nice square downwind here. Okay, so brakes are pressurized and parking brake is off. Under, undercarriage, speed below 133, gear selected down. Mix is full rich. Fuel is on and sufficient, don't need to change tanks. Uh, flaps, speed check below 110, flaps 1. Instruments are all in the green. Car feet don't have, got this, we'll cycle it. Hatches and harnesses secure and landing lights on, pre-landing checks complete. And before we get to Cockreave here, we're going to turn onto our base leg, quick look out for traffic. And again, 30 degrees angler bank turn, and we don't want to uh, stretch the turn out too much. And as we're coming around the corner here, we're going to select flaps two. Speed coming back to about sort of nine, between 90 and 85 knots. Aiming for about between six and 700 feet on the base of the final turn. Keeping an eye on the runway there. Keep yourself squared off using the uh, OBS line to cheat a little bit. And it is coming up to our base of the final turn now. And uh, we've gone a little bit earlier. It's okay, we can deal with that. So establish, configure, full flap, and we are reds, blues, and three greens. Plenty of trim. We're approaching about 80 knots. We're going to come over the numbers at uh, 75. Lovely, nice, and stable aircraft, but very heavy in pitch as you start to slow the aircraft down. But remember, as you start to flare, the tail is going to come into that slipstream unless your power is all the way off. So it's always best to kill the power completely before you get into the flare. Not bad. Flaps up. And here we go, full power, but we've got to keep an eye on our manifold pressure. So I'm going to set to about there, let it settle, then push the rest of the way to 41 inches. Looking for 75. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. 75 we have. And away we go with barely enough runway. That, my friends, is the Turbo Arrow Touch and Go. It is a uh, exciting experience, to say the least. Right, positive climb, 300 feet past. Gear up. Let's get the aircraft accelerating. We're too low to bring the power back to climb setting yet, so let's just accelerate 297. Get away from that ground as quickly as we possibly can. Plenty of right rudder and to keep it balanced. Now we can set for the climb. 
and save the ears of the uh, local residents a little bit. Very short crosswind leg, nice tight circuit here at Nottingham, so uh, let's make that turn. And you can see the difference between this uh, and the non-turbo arrow at this altitude. It's definitely more sluggish, it uses up a lot more runway, so be prepared for that. I come back on the power to our sort of 22, 2300 and then back to 2200. Now this is going to be a flatless approach, so in a second we'll set up for that. We'll be calling downwind on the radio at this point. And the aircraft's steadily accelerating. So brakes, speed below 133, gear down. Uh, mixtures full rich, mags are on both. Fuel is on and sufficient. And uh, let's change tanks. Flaps we're not going to use. Instruments are all in the green. Carpet don't have, we've got this. Hatches and harness are secure and the landing light is still on from the last time round. So flapless approach this time. So our speed management is a little more important. However, the Arrow is still a very draggy aircraft, so it's not the end of the world. Uh, if we're a little higher, a little fast on a flapless approach, I'm going to zoom that in slightly so I can cheat a little bit more effectively with the OBS line. I'm going to slow the aircraft down a touch before we start the descent, and then I'm going to let her come down. Now this, uh, the flapless approach, you're really going to notice the uh, the T-tail effects on this one because you're at low airspeed, high angle of attack. So it's very easy to sort of transition between the tail being in the prop slipstream and not being in the prop slipstream. So uh, keep a close eye on that. Touch high, touch fast. Uh, it should be about 85 knots at this point, so I'm going to idle the throttle. Reds, blues, greens, all checked. Aim for that centre line. Still a little bit fast. Not too much to be a concern though. Coming into the friction layer now. And she's floating. That's better, now she's coming down. And coming down, and there we go. Full power, set, oh, there's that overboost light, because I went a little bit too far. 75 knots and away we go. Climb at 80 initially. It really is a gotcha. There's our positive climb, passing 300 with insufficient runway, remaining gear up. And I'm going to go for a continuous turn onto downwind because this is going to be our uh, glide approach to land, hopefully. Or crash, as the case may be. Okay, let's let the aircraft accelerate. Set that climb prop setting and power setting. a lot of uh, nose up trim to deal with that flapless approach and so I'm having to wind it all off. Pretty much at the downwind point now. So let's do our checks. Brakes, undercarriage defer, mixture, full rich, mags are on both, fuel on and sufficient flaps, not required yet. Instruments are all good, car beat don't have, but we'll cycle this. Hatches and harness secure, landing lights on and I'm going to turn the aircraft now and we're going to go for the glide from here. Pitch to our best glide speed is about 90 knots in this aircraft. Trim, keep an eye on that runway. I think we're gonna make it. Touch the brakes, gear down below 133. I'm gonna go flaps one and flaps two. You can see just how quickly this aircraft descends once you start throwing flap and gear out. Gear pretty much, gear alone halves your glide range. And full flap now. Reds, blues, greens, sort the trim out. And here's the old arrow elevator to hell. And I'm wandering off the center line like an absolute idiot. Better rudder to fix that. And not a bad touchdown in the end. Beautiful, so aside from the dodgy flying, a very nice set of circuits from the uh, Turbo Arrow. OK, 
Okay, a runway vacated. Let's set the parking brake, 1200 RPM. And let's do our after landing checks. And the after landing checks in the arrow are pretty much a straight line through the cockpit, so we're going to check uh, trim in the neutral position. Flaps up. Uh, mixture can come back to save the spark plugs a little bit. We've got 1200 RPM set. Fuel pump can come off. Landing light can come off. Anti coils can come off. Pito heater can come off. Transponder can go to standby. And VFR is set. And we are ready to taxi in. Okay, so here we are, all parked up with our chocks inserted on the ground at Nottingham. And I think it is time for our conclusion into uh, this lovely aeroplane. So as usual, I've got a bunch of notes here that I made when I was flying and testing this aircraft. Um, and I'm going to go through them with the positives first and then the negatives. And then I'll come to my own personal conclusion. Bear in mind, this is just what I think you might have a completely different opinion of this aeroplane. Uh, and then I will sign off and bid you farewell until the next time. So, first of all, let's uh, let's hit those positives. So, I've got uh, the overall look and appearance of the aeroplane as the first positive uh, that I have here. So, the external and the internal uh, graphical uh, modelling of the aeroplane, I think, looks absolutely lovely. Uh, it's really bang on. They've got all the little antennas in the right place, and the panel lines are there in the right place, and um, everything sort of, all the little opening bits, so you got the baggage door, you've got the main door, the handles all move as they should, you can see that's moved to the open position up there, you can pop the oil filler cap open, uh, and all of this sort of stuff all works exactly as it should. Uh, all the little chocks and things that go in, and the tow bar, which comes in automatically when you press shift P, which is a really nice touch, uh, the little stickers on the prop, the heart cell stickers that you can read there, um, it's, it all just adds to, to making an aeroplane which looks very, very realistic. Um, that, of course, added to the fact that just flight aircraft are always a little bit kind of weathered up. Um, it just makes it really sort of sit very nicely in, in the world um, and give that uh, immersive impression. Put, put your head in the immersion box, as I, <laughs> as I said very uh, lamely in one of my previous reviews. So I think the, uh, the overall external model looks great. The internal, I mean, the panel especially, look how good that is. Uh, and all of the horrible velour is very beautifully weathered and they've obviously spent a lot of time making this and making it look very very realistic um, now the arrow 3 when it first came out had some slightly um, dodgy shall we say textures on the inside uh, they have fixed those bit by bit over time um, not every part of the interior is as photo real as some other aircraft are but they're all parts of the interior that you do not look at very often all the bits that you are staring at most of the time are as good as anything if not better than anything in uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator thus far, especially this panel. It's lovely, even though it's disgusting beige. Sticking with the panel, uh, the next thing I've got here is all of the instrumentation, uh, which is all custom built. Of course, a lot of it is carried over from the Arrow, from the Arrow 3, but that obviously is because it's another Arrow, so it's going to have much the same instrumentation. What's the point in making another one? Um, so, yeah, lovely custom made uh, dials, animations here, obviously. Uh, with the changes to the um, turbo arrow systems, all the placards are in place where they should be, um, all the radios and things like that. So yeah, lovely custom made panel, it's not one of these fancy glass panels either, it's a proper old fashioned steam gauge cockpit and it looks brilliant. Uh, also I've given them a plus for this uh, GTN 750 integration here, you, ooh, ooh, Jesus. Um, <laughs> you can go with the uh, standard um, set up. So if I put this on, I can switch it to the GPS 100 over here. So this is just the same as the Arrow 3, the default 530 and 430, uh, but I, or the 530 and the the sort of dodgy backup radio. But I think this uh, is a, a, such a good um, piece of kit, 
for free as well. I will leave a link to this in the description of this video if you do want to give it a go and I would certainly recommend it because it is a great representation and they are updating it constantly. Uh, the aim is to get it as close to the real thing as possible. I think that's uh, only going to add uh, enjoyment to Microsoft Flight Simulator, so I'm all for that. The next thing I've got, uh, staying mostly in the cockpit, is the um, accuracy of the, the systems modeling in the aircraft. So things like um, the alternate air actually works. Uh, we've got a um, alternate static source under here, which uh, actually works as well, I believe. I can find it. It's, it's under there somewhere. I'm not going to poke my head all the way under the panel. Um, the automatic gear extension system works, as I showed you. Uh, and the emergency extension on top of that, that's all very nicely modelled. All of the um, circuit breakers pop out, uh, as I showed you with the, the gear extension, and they all work. Uh, pretty much every switch in the entire aeroplane does something. You've got your dome light there, you've got your vents over here. Um, it, it's, it's absolutely... Uh, it's, it's very, very in-depth, and uh, you can just tell the amount of care and attention that's gone into that which I think is uh, very, very cool. Uh, sticking with systems and mechanical things, uh, I've got the overall representation of the turbo engine, which is, of course, the main draw of this aircraft over the standard Arrow 3. Uh, it's very ac accurately represent represented, and it means you have to operate the aircraft within the finicky and difficult parameters that you have to use for the real aircraft. Good luck doing those touch and goes and not getting the overboost light. <laughs> As you can see, I did it once myself. Um, you've got to just adjust yourself um, to the mode where you don't immediately go for full throttle when you go for you go around or you touch and go to set full power. Um, otherwise, you're going to get that overboost light and you're going to start wearing the engine out. And like I said, it's all modelled. The engine will fail on you. It will wear out. Uh, just like the battery will wear out, you'll use your oil quantity and all the rest of it. So it's very, very good. Um, keeping with this, the sort of engine systems and stuff, the primer all works. And as you can see, when I tried to start it up and it didn't start because I didn't have the throttle cracked open enough, all stuff like that it just adds to making the aircraft really, really immersive. Uh, and it's a really great representation of the real thing. Um, oh, vapor locks as well, I forgot to say. You can get vapor locks in this system. Um, which you have to do the proper hot start uh, procedure, which you do have a checklist for, as you can see there, warm engine. Um, so you have all the procedures available there, um, which is fantastic. That checklist itself um, and the documentation you get with the aircraft are very, very extensive. can only praise them um, for going to the trouble of including all of that stuff. But, I mean, if you're going to do um, a representation of an aircraft which is in, as in-depth as this one, you are going to need to provide that kind of documentation, which is fantastic. Um, state saving I've put down. This is something else that's on the Arrow 3, but it will save the state of the panel and the aircraft. So your oil will slowly wear down over time. Your engine will wear out over time if you keep abusing it. If you have the state saving turned on, of course, uh, which I have. So every time you get in the aircraft, the panel will be as you left it. So it almost feels like you're flying your own aeroplane. You parked it up. You reload into the sim on another day and everything will be as you left it, which is very, very cool indeed. The next one I've got, which is a really big one for me, and it's the overall accuracy of the flight model. Um, as you could see, it was performing pretty much on the numbers, very, very slightly uh, north of the numbers in the cruise speed uh, tests that I did, uh, but well within the, the variance that you'd expect in real life. The, the climb uh, rate was pretty much spot on in uh, both cruise climb and the full power climb. Um, the stalls were pretty much perfect, the steep turns pretty much perfect, uh, performance in the circuit was pretty much perfect, glide approach even though I did a crap job of holding the centre line um, was perfect, it came down like a brick with full flap and gear which is exactly what the real arrow does uh, and it means you need to be very very high uh, at the end of the downwind position if you are going to pull off one of those glide approaches properly. Um, also, just the, the general feel of the aircraft, how heavy it is, uh, it's just kind of a, I use this word a lot, but agricultural feeling aeroplane. It's a very old fashioned, heavy feeling aircraft, uh, and this uh, sim models it very, very well. Uh, it handles pretty well on the ground too, it feels heavy on the ground, perhaps a little bit too easy to get it rolling off the taxi, uh, but other than that, it does feel very good on the, on the ground. On the takeoff roll, as I demonstrated, um, the 
tail on the on the arrow four bear in mind the arrow three does not exhibit these characteristics but on the arrow four with the high t-tail when you come into the flare if you uh, if you sorry rotate a little bit early you'll find the yoke is very unresponsive and then it'll get past a certain uh, pitch attitude and all of a sudden you'll shoot into the air so i demonstrated that on the runway at doncaster when we were taking off um, that the yoke becomes a lot more uh, effective if you get it up to the proper rotation speed which is that bit, bit higher than the regular arrow so budget yourself that bit of extra runway uh, to deal with that also the climb performance not quite as good as the regular arrow so think about that too um, but yeah that this obviously just flight have modeled that absolutely perfectly which just shows how much care and attention has gone into uh, this aircraft so Overall, I would say the accuracy of the flight model of this aircraft is spot on. It is as good as the Arrow 3, which, as I said when that came out, that is the gold standard of light aircraft in this simulator right now. Um, the Surprisingly, the um, Carinado Seminole came very, very close um, to performing as good as, as these two aircraft. However, it let itself down with its single engine performance. Uh, but that is still a very, very good aircraft. I would say it is well up there in terms of twins. It's probably the best twin in the sim right now. Uh, but this is certainly um, holds the crown as the best overall GA aircraft, and it's not going anywhere from that, in my opinion, in terms of the accuracy, certainly, of the flight model. Um, something else that you may see as a big positive, um, you're essentially getting two aircraft for one. You're getting the Arrow 3 with its own specific particular flight model, and you're getting the Arrow 4 with its own specific particular flight model. Obviously, they both have the same engine systems and all the rest of it, uh, but they do handle differently. They perform pretty much the same, uh, but there is that little bit of variance in handling with the Arrow 4 with that T-tail, which is uh, very cool, very cool and very interesting. They all have their own little set of real world, very carefully, nicely modeled um, liveries as well, which look absolutely lovely. This, of course, is my favorite because I like the blue and white, um, <laughs> but uh, your mileage may vary on those, but I think they look great. Uh, so yeah, two for one. Um, overall, the Arrow, um, I've put down as a positive, just the fact that this is an interesting aeroplane. It's a bit of a pain in the backside in real life <laughs> for the reasons that I showed, uh, certainly on takeoff and landing. Uh, short airfields, it can be a real pain. Um, but in the simulator, this is a really interesting aeroplane to get to grips with um, and to just hold your attention, really, and, and keep you learning and wanting to learn and operate the aircraft uh, as you would operate in, in it in real life. Um, so I think that is a, is a real positive, too. Uh, Price-wise, it is the same price as the Arrow 3, if you were to buy these two aircraft separately. Um, however, if you've already bought the Arrow 3 from Just Flight, there is a 66% discount um, on this aircraft, which is really nice, very generous of them. Um, and there is also a bundle available, uh, which goes for about 40, 41 pounds, which equates to about sort of $63 if you want uh, both aircraft from the Just Flight store which honestly for, um, well, at, at worst, two aircraft, in my opinion, three aircraft, uh, which all have their own different looks and nuances and color schemes and all the rest of it, um, I think that is pretty good value, personally. Right, let us move on to the negatives and have a good whinge, as uh, we always like to do. Now, the first thing I've got on here is... Now, I know I was praising the, the model of the aeroplane earlier, and I, I do think the model is very good. However, it's it's not, in my opinion, the absolute best. I mean, you've got these funny panel lines still. Now, it's, it doesn't look too bad with the lighting is, is directly on it, so this is pretty much midday in the sim right now. But if it was half light, dust sort of evening time, as we had in the hangar, you've got those strange shadows down the panel lines, uh, which kind of distract from the looks a little bit. Plus, uh, if you sort of get very, very close, they're a little bit fuzzy. I mean, you'd have to be really, really anal um, to uh, to pull this aircraft up over its Texas, because I do think they're very, very good. However, I don't think they're quite as good as the Carinado aeroplanes are, uh, which are kind of the, the premier aircraft looks-wise. Plus, uh, I think that probably the, the uh, Flying Iron Spitfire is up there as well. Very, very nice-looking aircraft, that too. Um, so it's not quite on that level, just slightly behind, I'd say. And again, some of the interior textures, um, things you really don't look at that often, but like up here, a um, little bit fuzzy. Uh, in contrast to the absolutely excellent panel, which is as good as anything in the simulator, 
Um, there's a couple of other areas that are a little bit more fuzzy. It has been explained. Um, one of the developers I've seen has posted and said that the um, slightly less high-res textures in the, in the aircraft are to keep the frame rates um, good on slightly less capable systems, and I can certainly get behind that as a goal. So I, I don't think it's bad at all, and it's all in areas that you don't really look at. But some of you uh, who are real eagle eyes for that sort of stuff, that will affect your enjoyment of the aircraft. So um, public service announcement for that. Um, I'm being really, really picky here, but I'm just uh, going to pull it up for the couple things with the ADF and the manifold air pressure gauge. Uh, and this is something that goes to the Arrow 3 as well, to be fair, and it's probably a Microsoft Flight Simulator-ism more than anything. Um, but when you switch the ADF to antenna mode, it should park on the right wing, as it's doing now, as you can see, when it's fully off. But when you flick it to antenna mode, it should do that uh, as well, and then it should flick back towards the beacon when you turn it back to ADF. It doesn't do that at the moment, so it would be nice to see them rectify that. Same thing with the manifold pressure. Again, I think this is a, a FS2020-ism, um, something that the sim needs to sort out before just flight can model it properly. But um, the manifold air pressure should climb up a fair bit more than it does. It's only a very slight rise at the moment. It should pop up to about sort of two or three inches. Um, I was just looking on, on our arrow when I was flying it uh, yesterday. Obviously, it's ours isn't a turbo arrow. Um, but ours does pop up at about sort of two or three inches, which, I mean, the, the turbo is pretty much the, the same in that respect. As far as I can remember, it's been a little while since I've flown a turbo arrow. Um, something else which may sort of affect some of you who aren't um, so sort of into these aircraft, maybe you're not sort of a big GA aircraft fan, and you think, oh, it's, it's another arrow. Why have they done that? Um, <laughs> you may think that, you know, just flight... They've brought out one arrow, and the, the next release they've brought out, they've just gone for another arrow. Um, and I can completely understand why you might think that. You know, boring, oh, it's just another arrow. Who are they done that? Um, so, yeah, maybe they should have gone for something a bit different before um, releasing this at a slightly later date. I don't know. I'm not of that opinion because I love arrows. But um, I can certainly see, see where you're coming from if you think along those sorts of lines. Uh, the final negative that I've got on here is that you might consider the price a little steep. Certainly if you've uh, purchased the aircraft from the in-game Microsoft Store, um, and now the aircraft, the, the Just Flight Arrow 3, uh, is currently only available in some uh, local localization, some areas, um, not everywhere. Uh, but if you have bought it from the store and you do want to buy this, for example, now from Just Flight, you aren't going to get that 66% discount, unfortunately. So buying both aircraft at uh, £30 a piece, uh, about $40, so that probably equates to, that is going to run into uh, really quite a lot of money, and you might think that it is definitely not worth that. So I can understand that that might be a little bit annoying to you. Um, that there is not a kind of uh, discount scheme in place for the people who have bought it from the Microsoft Store. Uh, and you may, you know, you may sort of think that um, £30 or $40 is a, is a bit steep for a light aircraft anyway. Um, honestly, I am not of that opinion because I think an aircraft that is modelled to this level of depth and accuracy is well worth £30. But that's just my opinion, like I said. Um, so in conclusion, you can probably guess that I uh, love this aeroplane. I think it's very, very interesting. It's immersive. It sounds great. It looks great. It goes great. It works exactly as the real one should do. Um, and it's a great addition to my flight simulator hangar. And I've enjoyed testing and flying this over the last few days uh, very, very much indeed. I have to say thank you massively to Just Flight who have given me this aeroplane to test for free i would have bought it anyway because i love it uh, but i am a um penniless flying instructor as i'm always at pains to say so anything that we get sent on this channel to review for free we are massively massively grateful for um, so huge thank you to just flight it's not tainted my opinion on this aircraft at all i bought the arrow 3 and i was equally positive with that so if you don't believe me go back and watch that video um but uh, yes, I would think if I, uh, well, if they took this away or if they do take it away, it's perfectly up to them, uh, then I will certainly go out and spend my own money on this aircraft because I think it is absolutely worth every penny. Anyway, that's uh, my review of the Just Flight uh, Turbo Arrow 3 and 4. Let me know in the comments if you disagree, if you agree, 
if you want me to go out and test anything else on this aeroplane. Um, I will probably do a full review on the GTN 750 at some point. Um, so if you've got any questions about that, please put them in the comments. Uh, if you enjoyed the video, please consider giving it a like. Maybe consider giving us a subscription. Massive thank you to everybody who's already subscribed. We are now past 1,000 subs, which is a huge uh, moment for a little channel like ours. So really appreciate that. Thank you very much, everyone. And thank you much, you, for watching and sticking with me throughout this video. And hopefully I shall see you next time. Bye-bye.